Good evening, everyone. Hi. I'm Mary Hinton. I'm the president of the College of St. Benedict, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the annual College of St. Benedict Coach Chair Lecture entitled Compassion Matters. The Coach Chair in Catholic Thought and Culture was established through the generosity and extraordinary vision of Barbara and David Coach, cherished friends of the College of St. Benedict. An exemplary expression of the Catholic, Benedictine, and liberal arts mission of our college, the Coach Chair offers courses and provides diverse programming that help faculty, students, and our wider community better explore contemporary issues related to Catholic faith and culture by bringing the Catholic intellectual and cultural tradition into full and fruitful dialogue with academic disciplines. On behalf of the College of St. Benedict, I wish to express our continuing gratitude to the Coach family. Tonight, it is a particular privilege for me to introduce Dr. M. Sean Copeland, Professor of Systematic Theology at Boston College. Dr. Copeland earned her doctorate in Systematic Theology from Boston College in 1991. Before returning to BC in 2003 as a faculty member, she taught at St. Norbert College, Yale Divinity School, and Marquette University. She also, she, oh, she also taught for 12 years as an adjunct faculty member of the Institute for Black Catholic Studies at Xavier University in New Orleans. Dr. Copeland's research interests converge around issues of theological anthropology with particular attention to body, gender, and race, political theology, African and African-derived religious and cultural experience, and African-American intellectual history. A prolific author, Dr. Copeland's recent books include In Fleshing Freedom, Body, Race, and Being, and The Subservice Power of Love, the vision of Henriette DeLille. She is also the principal editor of Uncommon Faithfulness, the Black Catholic Experience. Dr. Copeland is a former convener of the Black Catholic Theological Symposium and a past president of the Catholic Theological Society of America. She's a recipient of several awards, including the Eve Conger Award for Excellence in Theology from Barry University, the Distinguished Scholar Award from the Black Religious Scholars Group of the American Academy of Religion, and the Sojourner Truth Award for her advocacy by the Black Women's Community Development Foundation. For those of you who've had an opportunity to read In Fleshing Freedom, you'll know that Dr. Copeland concludes the book by writing, and I'm quoting now, in our presence, the Son of Man gathers up the remnants of our memories the broken fragments of our histories, and judges, blesses, and transform them. His Eucharistic banquet reorders us, remembers us, restores us, and makes us one. It is that call to hope, compassion, and unity that ignites our Benedictine spirit at St. Ben's. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sean Copeland to our campus. Good evening, uh, and thank you all for being here. I fear you are escaping the debates. Uh, <laughs> I've provided a convenient excuse for some people. <laughs> I want to thank President Hinton uh, for her kind introduction, and uh, also thank uh, Professor Jennifer Vesti uh, for this invitation, and thanks to all the groups uh, that co-sponsored uh, this event and our conversation, and if I could just single out the librarians, uh, I'm very grateful for the library organizing a book discussion and making books available to all who participated. I also uh, want to thank uh, in uh, Dr. Bestie's office, uh, Mrs. Shank, who saw to many of the practical details around this, 
And uh, it was wonderful uh, to see some friends uh, over the past few days. And uh, I especially want to uh, thank um, the uh, students in uh, the moral theology class this morning for a really spirited and engaged conversation. I really appreciated it, and I learned from it. I don't know where you are. I hope you're here. Uh, OK. <laughs> This is what you need, like a little amen corner, you know. <laughs> so I'm counting on you. Uh, uh, finally, uh, let me say that um, I do know that your community has had the experience of great sadness and uh, anxiety over the last few weeks. And uh, I want to extend to you uh, my own concern and care. And I hope that in our conversation uh, that I will also learn how you have extended compassion to one another and to others uh, during this time. To say that something matters is to say that something has significance or importance in and of itself or for its effect. Three examples. First, to say that breakfast matters is to say that this particular meal is important because of its effect. So nutritionists, dining hall chefs, and parents all insist that breakfast is the most important meal of the day, certainly because after hours of sleep or all-night essay writing uh, or partying, uh, <laughs> the body craves and requires nourishment. Second, to say that earth matters is to say that planetary conditions for the survival and stability of ecosystem biodiversity are important. Scientists and environmental advocates are teaching us that acid rain, depletion of the ozone layer, topsoil erosion, deforestation, and human carelessness present serious challenges to that survival and stability, indeed of all planetary life. Third example, to say that human life matters is to say that human life is significant. In each instance, compassion makes a claim. The first example is somewhat trivial, although not entirely so. To say that breakfast matters is to say something about what, for many of us, is an ordinary occurrence, something to be taken for granted, although there are some others for whom this is not the case. The second example raises social and ethical questions. To say that Earth matters is to point to an issue that some consider an urgent problem, that others dispute is a problem, and that others still simply ignore. The third example implicates the serious and complex. To say that human life matters is to say something biological, something medical, something social, political, existential, philosophical, and theological. All those areas express its significance. To say that the lives of children, women, and men escaping war in Syria matter is to speak about human life under duress and in distress. For some, this condition warrants urgent response. For others, neutrality, and for others, still indifference. The third example importunes and indicts compassion. For human life is something the existence of which in itself possesses absolute value and worth. If I might quote the philosopher Immanuel Kant, the human being exists as an end in itself, not merely as a means to be used by this or that will at its direction. Instead, Humans, I'm paraphrasing here since he, has, he says he, humans must in all their actions, whether directed to themselves or also to other rational beings, always be regarded at the same time as an end. Human beings then are valued as inviolable ends. Human lives matter. And the cry and claim of a human life on our compassion ought to be considered absolute. This evening, I should like to reflect with you on compassion and how it matters. And some of the questions I shall attempt to answer are these. What is compassion? What does it demand? 
of whom and to whom, why ought compassion matter, and to whom and does it matter, and why? What does our Catholic intellectual tradition have to say about compassion? Notions of transformation, relationality, and solidarity offer some clues in probing these questions. And I want to do this in three parts. I assume that there are some people here who are writing a short paper from this lecture. <laughs> so there are three parts. <laughs> the first part deals with a kind of etymology of compassion and uh, poses some descriptions. The second part uh, probes the structure of compassion, taking into account affective, cognitive, and moral transformation in solidarious response to compassion's demands. And the third offers some responses regarding active, engaged, compassionate solidarity for human and humane living in a world in which dehumanizing suffering has become nearly taken for granted. So first, considering compassion. The English word compassion derives from the Latin compassio, from compati, meaning to sympathize, and the Latin com plus pati, meaning to bear or to suffer. So quite literally, compassion means to suffer with. Synonyms for compassion include commiseration, feeling, sympathy. Antonyms or opposite denotations include heartlessness, callousness, and perhaps most chilling of all, indifference. Compassion denotes sympathetic consciousness of others and entails informed, critical awareness and understanding of their situation. Compassion is a mode of relationship and a power that is critically conscious of and challenged by the suffering of others and that acts, does something, acts with them to resist that suffering, to liberate and to heal the human spirit, and to repair breakdowns in the orders in which we live, particularly the interpersonal orders. This compassion, th thus compassion contains not only an emotional dimension, but a cognitive and moral one as well. Compassion goes beyond pity with its recent nuances of condescension and superiority toward the sufferer. Theologian Wendy Farley writes, compassion is an enduring disposition <clears throat> that functions to integrate elements of world engagement. It should not be isolated into a single faculty such as emotion or responsibility nor should it be understood as an accidental response to a particular event of suffering. So what I'm trying to do by thinking about this uh, really is to come up with something that's more systematic. Compassion then requires, as I understand it, the whole self as in acting, feeling, understanding, interpreting, valuing, embodied, other-directed being, committed to become the servant of compassion's care for the world. It focuses on service and accompaniment, not on dropping in to fix a situation or a person, not on short-term, but long-term responses. Compassion then springs from deeply felt emotional responses to another's undeserved misfortune or suffering and a willingness to be transformed by that suffering and what it discloses about the self, relationships, and the world. Compassion is realized or made visible in knowledge of the seriousness of the suffering and in commitment to struggle alongside and on behalf of those suffering or oppressed to change the situation. Thus it calls for courage, strength, and the deployment of non-coercive power. This is the second part, the structure of compassion. So I want to try to lay out what I think are some of the elements of compassion. Compassion originates from a deeply felt response to an awareness of the suffering or oppression of another, or to an awareness of structural injustice. 
So we know these expressions. One is moved to tears or moved to respond. We're moved. Moved by the plight of hurricane victims or refugees swimming for their lives or homeless children sitting in a park. Encountering these persons, these events, moves us. This affective awareness uncovers painful realities and perceives the corresponding need to transform one's deepest life of feeling, to reorient oneself through discernment, to choose what one will love and what one will reject. Without such radical reorientation of our passionate desires, we would continue to be obsessed with our own self-interests and needs rather than the interests and needs of others. This reorientation, then, must be thoroughly personalized in the decision of commitment to love. And such commitment is powerful when it crystallizes the other-centered reorientation of feeling. Still, loving commitment is directed towards service where the criterion of passion commitment to others lies in action. Affective transformation then tills the soil of the heart for compassion's work of care. Still, the effectiveness of that work also requires knowledge. So I want to look then at knowledge. As effective, <clears throat> compassion involves a tripartite cognitive element. So the first is the cognitive, so three parts. The three parts are perception, understanding, and identification. The first element involves the perception that the situation is serious rather than trivial. In other words, that to which compassion responds, what is at stake, matters. It's important, significant, or as Aristotle says in his rhetoric, what matters it has size. The occasion or events that Aristotle cites as worthy of compassion focus on death, bodily assault or ill treatment, sickness, lack of food, lack of friends, separation from friends, physical weakness, immobility, absence of good prospects. Candace Clark, in a uh, study uh, of contemporary American attitudes towards suffering or misfortune, the study is entitled Misery and Company. She writes, uh, suffering or misfortune or, quote, plights caused by bad luck or victimization by forces beyond a person's control. The list of misfortunes that we Americans consider serious include war trauma, sexual abuse, physical abuse, crime victimization, disaster victimization, for example, earthquakes or hurricanes, homelessness, divorce or loss of partner, discrimination, for example, in jobs or housing, political victimization, for example, liberties abridged by a tyrannical government, and social ostracism. So she, she does this by interviewing people to find out what ordinary people think is really something which really demands our compassion. These are some of them. Now certainly cultures and societies differ <clears throat> one from another in naming and assessing just what a serious plight might be. And she stresses the fact that Americans, us, we tend to identify more relatively mild predicaments in our lists of plights. And she also challenges us that we are not very tolerant of ambiguity, that we tend to place events either in the realm of inevitability, chance, fate, and luck, or in the realm of intentionality, responsibility, and blame. The second cognitive element, so 
This first is perception. It has to be serious. The second is understanding. We have to understand the situation of suffering or of structural injustice. Now, this may seem a very simple, even obvious element, but it is not. And it isn't because understanding itself is problematic. So we talk a little bit about what in philosophy is called cognitional theory, epistemology. When we speak to one another about our intellectual work, about how we think, you're working on a paper, you're doing research, you're trying to figure something out, how can I hammer out my thesis? And you say, wow, look what I, look what I got. See what I mean? We use these ocular metaphors, metaphors rooted in the myth that knowing is looking. Hmm? Take a look. Let's take a look, you say. So, so we're, we're in class today, and so let's look at the, look at the passage. Like, help me find it. Hmm? That's important. But the meaning isn't just there. The meaning is in here. This is the point. The meaning is in here. So the persistence of this idea that knowing is looking and that objectivity is seeing what there is to be seen. This is difficult for us. This myth, as I say again, makes it difficult, if not nearly impossible, to figure out what's just sense experience and what is a world mediated by meaning. So cognitive transformation really overcomes this myth, and this overcoming is rooted in understanding what knowing is and knowing is not. This might feel a little bit dry, but it's important. Knowing is not taking a look, not even a long look. And objectivity is not seeing what is already out there now to be seen. We are all aware of the existence of realities we cannot see. For example, friendship or happiness. We cannot see friendship, but we can see our friends and enjoy time with them. And the relation that develops between us is the friendship. We cannot see happiness, but we can join in activities that bring us joy, delight. We don't see delight, we don't see joy, but we the relation of being involved in something brings something else about. To understand properly, we would agree that we give real attention to experience. We talked a little bit about this today as well. And by experience, I certainly mean sense experience. Sight, sound, smell, touch, taste. That's where it all starts. But there's also psychological experience, biological experience cultural experience, and social experience. We test all those experiences by questions. Rather than simply assume, this is my little example for the day, rather than simply assume that the twisted shape on the patio in my garden is a decaying field mouse, I want to question what I see. What is it? What I see, well, it looks like the carcass of a field mouse. So I keep moving on to my back door and dinner. But in fact, I do not know that it is a field mouse. I'm assuming by a glance, a look at its shape, that that is what it is. I've decided on the basis of an assumption, not on the basis of knowing. If I had questioned my initial answer, I would have had to have asked, is it really a field mouse? And to answer that question, I would have to come closer. And had I done that, I would have learned that the form was, in fact, not the carcass of a field mouse, but a twisted, sunburned, water-soaked leaf from the catalpa tree. To verify this, I would need to ask, what are the conditions of a leaf? OK, so it looks like the leaf. But what are the conditions of being a leaf? And does that form meet those conditions? I would have determined that the form has the properties or characteristics of a leaf and not a field mouse. That little stem sticking up was not a tail. It's a leaf. If I had done that, I would have known that it was a leaf, not simply assumed, not just guessed and moved on. 
This works in our daily life, in our relations with one another. We see and we make assumptions. Well, this is a halt on this. It's a break with it. To think and to question again. The first question, what is it, is a question for intelligence. The second question, is it really so, is a question for reflection. And the third question <clears throat> is a question for verification. Is the evidence sufficient? Having relied on empirical investigation rather than guessing, reflecting on the properties of the object and having verified those, I can now choose intelligently how to respond from among several options and then decide and finally act appropriately, knowing, knowing then, is the conjunction of experience, understanding, judging, and deciding. It's not just experiencing and judging. Understanding is pretty important in this process. The third cognitive element of compassion, I, I want to argue, is a recognition that the flourishing and well-being of those suffering or oppressed is related to my own flourishing and well-being. This is even more complex than trying to think about epistemology and understanding. Huh? In order for compassion to be present, I must recognize the suffering of another as significant in my own life's being. This recognition makes me vulnerable in the person of the other and functions as an indispensable epistemological requirement for compassion. So we have these three, perception, understanding, recognition. To effectively carry out compassion's care, the affective and the cognitive must be tied to moral transformation and to action in solidarity. So moral transformation upends the criteria by which we take our bearings and appraise various options for choice and decisions. I dare say that, that many of you in this room have had that experience. New values are presented to you which you engage and find meaningful. They matter. And you change your own behavior, your own course of action, even if for a while. Moral transformation helps us discern what is truly good and what is simple satisfaction. And when these two conflict, moral transformation supports our adherence to what is truly good. In this discernment, we can discover our own potentialities as well as the potentialities of others. We may also discern and determine and expose instances of breakdown in our society. In this discernment, we eliminate individual and group bias by habitually choosing to do what is intelligent and responsible and so practical. And in this process, authentic long-term solutions to complex problems may emerge, and authentic progress and practical intelligent action may be made more probable. Well, why probable? Because moral transformation is never easy and never simple. It's never easy to do the right thing. Why probable? Because moral transformation is not moral perfection. It's a leap into a new possibility. It's a step. It's a struggle. Moral transformation is not moral perfection. Moreover, the effort to meet the demands of moral transformation brings the meaning of personal responsibility and the ideal of authentic human living into sharp relief. For moral transformation is not so much an achievement as it is a commitment. You all have high ideals. No one is more idealistic than people in college and university, and it should be that way. That, that's why we teach, because your idealism inspires us. But you want something authentic, and trying to get at it is very difficult for all of us. That's why moral transformation is not moral perfection. It's a leap, it's a step, it's on the way. Moral transformation, let me repeat, is not so much an achievement as it is a commitment. Now this commitment must express itself in active, authentic solidarity. 
Authentic solidarity is no mere common sense identification with or among members of the same group, the same nation, the same class, the same ethnic heritage, gender, or race. Although such identification may be beneficial and sometimes even necessary. Solidarity ought not to be confused with identity politics, although it does involve acknowledgement of identity and of difference. Again, solidarity never aligns itself with acquiescence or tendencies to persuade us to forget the cruelty and conflict that domination causes. Solidarity is an intentional, moral, and ethical task. It is no quick fix slogan or momentary gesture toward the nagging signs of breakdown and decline in our own social order, poverty, homelessness, mass incarceration, homophobia, transphobia, anti-Semitism, racism, and sexism. No quick fixes. These forms of social oppression assault our connectedness to one another by setting up dominative stru structural relations of injustice. In as much as solidarity involves an attitude or disposition, it entails acknowledgement and acceptance of the humanity of the other as humanity, along with regard for the other in her and his own otherness. As a theological category for Christian social action or social practice, praxis or living out social justice, solidarity expresses concretely the compassionate incarnation of Christian love. The deep ground, from a Christian perspective, the deep ground of solidarity in the interruption of social violence, whether subtle and private or overt and public, is the cross of the crucified Jewish Jesus of Nazareth. As the objective of a practical theology, authentic solidarity implies personal and interpersonal awareness, understanding, intentionality, and action. Solidarity then is the firm and persevering determination to commit oneself to the common good. In other words, to commit oneself to the good of all and of each human person because we are all really responsible for and to one another for all. Solidarity then is rooted in the interconnectedness of our being human in our common creatureliness. Humanity is no mere collection of individuals or aggregate of autonomous, isolated monads. We are one intelligible reality, <coughs> multiple, diverse, varied, concrete, and one. Whatever our creedal confessions, cultural heritages, historical backgrounds, political affiliations, social classes, races, sexual orientations, or gender, we human beings all, all are intrinsically, metaphysically, ineluctably connected. I want to get to the third part now compassionate solidarity in the concrete, because we're all one. Compassion matters. As I've sketched it out, compassion includes the following dimensions. Affective openness to suffering or oppressed others. Secondly, the capacity to recognize the gravity of the injustice persons suffer to understand that injustice and to perceive our connectedness and interrelatedness to these others. The willingness to interpret contexts of injustice from the perspective of those who suffer. An active commitment to create new relationships aimed to transform ourselves and our social reality. It is really not too much to say that the state of human relations in our nation has reached a decidedly low point. 
And as such, that state importunes and indicts compassionate solidarity. Even if controversial, it's appropriate, I think, to return to the third example with which I began. Human life matters. Human lives matter. Certainly, and without hesitation or equivocation, I want to affirm that all life matters. All human lives matter. And they matter in their particularity. Brown lives matter. White lives matter. Red lives matter. Yellow lives matter. And yes, black lives matter. The whole of Catholic theological, philosophical, and social taught, thought teaches us that life matters. To honor life, we must scrutinize the reality in which we do live. To honor life, we must critically understand and grapple with the social realities in which we do live. And to honor life, we must act for justice and promote human flourishing. Our Catholic tradition emphasizes and engages humanity's essential humanness. Our tradition offers us a theology of the person that acknowledges and witnesses to the irreducible imprint of the divine image in each human, be each human creature, to the oneness of human creatures, even as it honors the richness of our diversity as a fundamental feature of our unity and situates human creatures within the fractile and beautiful order of creation. Further, our tradition reminds us that our resistance to injustice and oppression of others is rooted not in an arrogant drive to triumph over evil, but in love of other persons. In a public conversation uh, nearly a year ago at Boston College, the Peruvian liberation theologian Gustavo Gutierrez remarked that the poor, quote, are those who have no right to have rights. The poor are those who have no right to have rights. I think his observation opens up for us an understanding so that the notion of the preferential option for the poor as a significant evangelical and theological category encompasses all those children, women, and men whom society marginalizes, renders powerless, culturally suppresses, and permits to endure unprovoked, unchecked violence. Now, given the context in which this presentation is being offered, I suspect it ought to conclude with some recommendations, but I have just one. And not surprisingly, it turns on education. In order to foster compassion, we, youth, adults, children, college students, graduate students, all of us, parents, uncles, aunts, everybody, all of us, we need to educate our imaginations. There's a connection, I think, between imagination and acts of oppression. Unless we properly educate our imaginations and discipline our hearts, we are ever more vulnerable to the cruel biases and stereotypical assumptions that lead us to reject and to oppress one another, to deface the image of God in one another, to destroy the common good. How do we do that? I think through stories and dramas, novels and well-chosen films, we can learn to decode the suffering and the pain of others, and this decoding should lead us into the lives of others who are near and who are far. When I got on the plane to come here, I thought Minnesota, and I thought, wow, Louise Erdrich. I thought of all those wonderful novels of the saga of people just trying to live. I thought of the wonderful novel, Giants in the Earth, all about the prairie, what people endure it to be here. Enriching my own imagination over time. When I saw the film Brooklyn, as soon as that young woman got on the boat with her suitcase, I started weeping because I knew precisely what would happen to her. No, 
not in detail, but I know the trajectory of that Irish story because I read The Great Hunger. We have to enrich our imaginations in as many ways as we can because that decoding helps us learn to decode the suffering of others. We need to learn and imagine and understand the experiences and emotions of others because there are experiences and our emotions. We need to learn to imagine, learn the many obstacles as well to that understanding. The pitfalls that a self-centered imagination might run into as it attempts to be just. We can, nor can we, or should we simply imagine ever that we can completely understand the life of a person or a cultural, ethnic, or racial group different from our own. We can't. We get a good trajectory often, but not in its totality. Self-criticism is crucial. So we must confront and continually criticize our own fear, our own greed, the demand for power that makes interactions between groups and nations and races and people, men and women. Confront the demand for power that makes these interactions so likely to produce misunderstanding and worse. Let me suggest that there is a, a kind of opposition between what I would call an educated imagination and a self-centered or biased one. Where a self-centered imagination is inattentive, incurious, and self-absorbed, the educated imagination is attentive, perceptive, and expansive. Where the self-centered imagination is rigid, exclusionary and narrow, the educated imagination is supple, inclusive, and open, reaches outward. Where the self-centered imagination is furtive and resentful and spiteful, the educated imagination is free and generous and unstinting and moral. Where the self-centered imagination is accusatory and irresponsible, the educated imagination is committed and responsible. Where the self-centered imagination thrives on fear and despair, the educated imagination flourishes with trust and hope. As a nation, we are wrestling with tough stuff, with deep impasses and fractures in our social and human relations. Compassionate solidarity in this context means vigorous and persistent defense of the absolute character and value of human life even human life made concrete in black bodies and black lives. We must resist the temptation to reduce any human person or any group of persons to statistics or problems, to stereotypes or labels. And we must honor all women and men as instances of the intelligible as intelligent in the world, instances of incarnate moral and ethical choice in a world under the influence of sin, yet standing in relation to a field of grace. Catholic social taught, thought teaches us to value solidarity as an achievement of community, a community of mutually affirming, autonomous selves, a project antithetical to the monological premises of the dominating status quo. We have to shoulder responsibility together. And this shouldering of responsibility obliges us in the here and now to stand between those who are suffering on the one hand and the powers of oppression in a society on the other, and to do all we can to stop their marginalization, their exploitation, their abuse, and murder. We do this in memory of the crucified Jewish Jesus. We accept this obligation in his name, even if we must endure rejection or loss. Christian identity repudiates any form of masochism, any ascent to suffering for its own sake. We may suffer, but not for its own sake. Solidarity affirms life even in the face of sin and death. 
This shouldering of responsibility works actively for justice in the concrete and admits of particular tasks for each of us by virtue of our differing social locations, our skills, our training, our talents. It always requires us to be on guard against any form of self-defeat, sorry, self-deceit, self-defeat as well, but self-deceit or self-delusion. Any attempt to deny freedom and obligation or to act as though the world were devoid of the poor, the homeless, the immigrant, the despised, and excluded. No woman or man alone can undertake such shouldering. Here's where agopic praxis, Christian love, is the great characteristic of Christian community. In remembrance, then, of the body of Christ that's broken for the world, the followers of Jesus, in solidarity with one another, stand shoulder to shoulder beside and on the side of those who are exploited, despised, and excluded. Because this is what anticipates in the here and now God's redemptive eschatological healing and restoration of our broken and maimed bodies, even a broken and divided body politic. So let me conclude here by saying that we really need grace. We need grace for solidarity and for community. We are in need of the grace of interruption to change our course, to accept fully the challenge of compassionate solidarity in the, in the concrete. We are in need of the grace of liberation to free us from the gravity that impedes the human spirit and that anesthetizes our deepest desires for a more fruitful, more creative living and loving. We are in need of the grace of risk. This grace opens us to the promptings of the spirit to respond to the word that calls to speak and to listen to one another. This grace edges us pushes, nudges us to dis-ease and discomfort with whatever might obscure the sight of the glory of God on the face of another human being. This, I think, is our Christian mission. This is what our tradition urges us to do. It urges us to become who we were created to be. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, for such a thought-provoking, powerful presentation. I can't think of a topic that's more timely right now. Uh, we have time for about 10 to 15 minutes of questions. And for the students in the audience, uh, Dr. Copeland is having a luncheon with students tomorrow. And I could squeeze in four more students. So if you find me after the lecture, the first four, yeah, free lunch and you can bring it's for you so you can bring any question topic that comes to you and have a great time so all right 10 to 15 minutes Is anybody going to get an extra point for asking a question? <laughs> let's, let's start right there, and then we'll come here. OK, all right. Next. OK? Right here. She's getting a point for asking a question. So we, want to, we always want to help. Is that enough for an African-American person that has been oppressed for so 
it is a very uh, provocative and controversial question, and it's a real one, I hope, in the sense that it's your question, because that's really, that's meaningful, and that matters. Lyndon Johnson, uh, when he was president, was at um, Howard University, and if there are historians here of either the presidency or American history, contemporary American history, you can correct me, and I'm happy for it. Um, he, he gave a speech there uh, just at the time of the uh, dis discussions around uh, voting rights and affirmative action. And he used this analogy that uh, it's great to say we're all at the starting line. But if I've been the person who's been shackled for the whole time without the proper nourishment, training, or so on, I'm not going to get there. Uh, it's not even a contest. It's not even a contest. You're going you're gonna to be well ahead of me, and there's nothing I can do about it because conditions. So there's something about conditioning uh, our freedoms. We all essentially have free will, huh? But we all are experiencing social conditions of various kinds which put some constraints on our freedom. Now, in, in, lots of re, in lots of ways, I'm thinking about freedom in a much general, more general way. I realize you're talking about social freedom. Um, professors who are parents have certain constraints that professors who don't have children don't. I might not have to get home to make dinner at a certain time or pick up someone at a baseball game or, because that's as, just as important uh, being a parent to that little person as it is picking up some speaker. So, so my, my freedom to do and make certain decisions is constrained by this life. We all here in this country are constrained by our, our past because our past has con created a certain set of conditions out of which we all operate. Some of us, you know, some of us can look at the past and want us to move on. And others of us who are trying to move on are, are just that, trying to move on. But there are some conditions that remain, not just that are, not internal conditions, but really, although there can be real internal conditions, you can learn to accept your own inferiority. Someone can tell you you are inferior for so long that you can begin to believe it. And that's the difficulty, that's one difficulty. But the greater difficulty is that some people don't give up thinking that you're inferior, even if you give it up. So there's a wonderful uh, literary professor at Columbia University, Sadia Hartman, um, who, who says, we are all living in the time of slavery. And she means the time that slavery created. This is the time. This is the time. We're still living in it. So it's incumbent on us, I mean, the Christian community, to provide some leadership here, both acknowledging our flaws. This is what President Bush said the other day. Huh? A great nation is not afraid of its flaws. We know about confession. We also know about penance. So I would, I would say to the Christian community, all of us, Catholic, Protestant, look, pay attention. There's a demand of compassion and solidarity here. You can, can, that can be construed a lot of ways. I mean, some people are thinking, well, you just can't hand out things to people. Well, but there's a lot of work going on, people working very hard, trying very hard. I suspect nobody's giving you grades. I suspect you're doing your own reading, I hope, and your homework, and yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a little bit of an answer, huh? But to have you think a little bit more about it. Hmm? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, all right. Yes, right down here, I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm interested in, in the issue of something that Augustine brings up in the Confession when he talks about the fact that he can go to plays and he can... That he can go to plays and sit there and weep when Aeneas and Dido uh, are separated. And 
he says, I can't bring that out into the rest of my life. And so my question is, though I agree with you on the, very much on the training of the imagination, is that there's still that big leap at the end. And so like, like Augustine, you can be weeping for Dido, yeah. and then you can go out yeah. and see that baby on the shore of, yeah. of yes. and not do yeah. anything. Yeah. And so I want to, what I see this step as love, as compassion, et cetera, mm -hmm. but what moves mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. for a what, person? What takes it beyond? Even mm -hmm. with the understanding of solidarity. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, this is what's really tri tricky because you can say back to me that compassion is unreliable. You can't rely on it. That's, you know, I, I'm, I'm there, I'm moved, but I, okay, so that's, that's really too bad, but I walk on. And, and here's, the only thing I can come up with really is our own self-criticism. That is to say, when I look at that little boy lying on the shore, I have to ask myself, how did he get there? And how am I implicated, since we're all one, how am I implicated in him getting there? So I, I have to press myself in self-criticism, in self-critique, a self-examine, if you like. Uh, what's the connection to me? There is a connection. You could say, well, no, there really isn't. I don't know that person. But if we're all one human people, there is a connection. You know, maybe I have to find a better way to drive it home. You know, but, but I think that's the only thing I can really, I can wrap my mind around. I'm not that little boy. I have lots of choices. You know, they may be limited in some, in some fashions, but they're not, they're not completely limited. But, but I have to say that that little child's flourishing as a human is imp implicates my, my own, you know. And it's not, I, understand, I know that it's not, it's not a strong answer back. But, but it's where I can get right now. That's where I'm trying to get at this a little bit in some different ways. But I, I, that, that's where I am. You know? That's why I think, um, yeah, these are all these, you know, Erdrich is writing about all these people. You know, oh, gosh, I don't know about that. But wow, there, there's, there's joy there. There's hope. There's humor. There's engagement. There's laughter. Yeah, there's sadness. So there are people just like the people I know. They're not some strange, weird other. And, and that's the point that I'm always trying to get to with people, you know. It's just us humans on the earth, on the planet. You know? But this is good. Thank you. Thank you. Way in the back and then here, but way in the back. She's coming with the mic, so don't stream. Hi, you, thank you for coming. You thank mentioned you. that um, we have to educate our imaginations. How do we, um, let's say, limit something that is supposedly supposed to be limitless? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Imagination is limitless. Is that, is that what you intend? Imagination is sort of limitless? Seems, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. well, well, we do. I mean, in fact, we do. We, we narrow our imaginations by thinking that my world is the only world. And in some ways, you know, all of us, our, 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 our culture, our family teaches us that. I mean, we're, we're very, you know, we're very like this. We're in our little boxes. And the thing is to, is to kind of break out of the box. And that's why, you know, you don't have to be Irish to feel for that woman getting on that boat. Here's a person, you know, okay, it's a, it's a fictional construction, but here's a person who's giving up all that she loves to try something really new, not knowing how it's going to turn out. Well, that's what happens to you when you go to college for the first time. You're getting in that car with your parents, you're driving off, you know, and you're being really bold, like, well, this is nothing. <laughs> it's everything. It's everything, you know? Your friend's back home. You're, um, you're not going to see him for a long time. Your best friend is going to another school, you know? You're breaking up with that girl you were dating, you know? Because, gosh, you're uh, over here at St. John's, and she went to Notre Dame. Okay. <laughs> 
If she'd gone to BC, you'd be happy, you know? <laughs> But, but the thing is that, is that we're all, we, we all can get that emotion. It's not limited to one little set of people. So, so you start to figure out, when we do Pulse at Boston College, which is our service learning program that, that I used to teach in the core, and it, I love that program, you know, but the students start out at the beginning, all oh, these kids are so different, you know. They're going to Roxbury, they're going to the inner city, you know, like, like Boston is an inner city, you know, it's like, please. <laughs> But okay, they're going, they're going. Because I finally learned that you all never get on a bus. You all get driven around by your parents, you know? And, and so finally, getting on a bus is a big deal. Getting on the T is a big deal. So I'm getting sympathetic. And then you come back and you say, well, they're so different. And I say, well, what does that mean? Well, they're different. What it means is that they're black, you know? And then it's like, well, they're different. And then by the third week, they're just like all those other kids that I deal with in the summer, in its summer camp. It's just being, because the imagination is being broken open. Because somebody's told you that those people are really different. They're not like us. And everybody says it. You know? Those white people are not like us. Those black people are not like us. Those people, they're not like but it's, it's your connection. It's your connection. It's your connection. And, and that's the risk. It's a risk to make a connection. Because you can be rebuffed. You can be rejected. But it doesn't mean that you're freed from making the connection. You're not free from it. Not if you're, not if you're I would say if you're a Christian, but I would go farther and say if you're really a universal human being, you're not free to the connection. You know, because because you're not gonna we're not gonna save the earth because we're Christian. You know, we're we're trying to save the planet because we care about life, and so we can care about human life. You know, is that is that useful? Okay, <laughs> Notre Dame. Okay, all right. <laughs> I'm very bad. I'm sorry, but not really. <laughs> They used to steal our students, that's what it was, you know. It's like, anyway. um, you spoke quite a bit about suffering, and uh, I, I want to paraphrase. Um, you, you said that uh, the Christian understanding of suffering is not suffering for suffering's sake. Yeah. But isn't it part of the Christian tradition, too, to have a certain amount of acceptance of suffering and to almost glorify suffering as well? Well, that's the downside of our tradition, isn't it? You know? And how does that impact our solidarity? Yeah, it does, because I can, I can get really, uh, uh, I can start to glory in it, and I'm suffering more for you than you could possibly ever know. And because of my suffering, you're going to be saved. Huh? I mean, there's a certain arrogance to that, huh? But there's also the fact that we can't escape suffering. You just can't escape it. We get it, no matter what you do, in whatever, whatever way it might come to you. Um, Jesus doesn't choose to suffer, you know. He's not running up there going, crucify me, you know. But he is committed to keep doing what he set out to do, what he was sent to do. And he doesn't stop doing it, even if you know the risk. Hmm? So you can think of figures. I mean, you know, we're, we're, here we are, you know. I mean, this Martin Luther King Jr., we all think, oh, great, he was so great, you know. Well, he's struggling, too. He's, he's sitting there thinking, you know, wow, I, I, I don't know if I can do this. You know, the 25-year-old pastor drafted into being the leader of a movement because he was the new guy in town. He didn't know where the bodies were buried. Huh? All the other people knew all the stuff that was there, but so they pull him in. Huh? And, and there he is sitting there praying with his little coffee cup and saying, you know, I, I don't know. I don't think I can do this, God. And he tells us, he heard a voice say, Martin Luther King Jr., stand up for justice. Yeah. So he, he's running the risk. He doesn't stop. He's not perfect, but he doesn't stop. He keeps on persevering with his mission. You know. Malcolm X you know, starts off life really well in Flint, Michigan. Hmm? His father is killed by the Ku Klux Klan. And, and here he is in school. People are starting to turn, you know, oh, wait a minute, you know, what are you going to be? He says, I want to be a lawyer. Oh, 
that's no room for you to be a lawyer. You should try to be a shoeshine boy. I mean, somebody already is crimping his spirit, you know? And through all of the, the incredible, horrible things that he does, he really has for himself a kind of cognitive conversion, a religious conversion, a moral conversion. And he becomes a moral principled man. And then he finds out he's wrong. And he does it again. He goes through this to find out what he really should be and what his mission is. And it costs him his life. He says in, in his biography, he says, you know, I was at, uh, he was giving a lecture, I think maybe at Harvard, and a young white woman said to him, what can I do to help? And he said, nothing. And at the end of his life, he said, if I could find her, I would tell her what she could do. She could be in solidarity. So, so suffering might be the end if we persist in our mission, but it's not something we pursue for its own sake. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sean.